we'll start by saying I am not a morning person. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so the title of my talk is um, uh, Deliberately Provocative. Um, I kind of wanted to give you um, my excitement or convey my excitement about the fact that um, there seems to be a, a new era in place where we're actually seeing a lot of wireless research activity, particularly at the physical layer and cross-layer design. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, I'm gonna make the bold statement that wireless has become the enabler of our society. Today, we do pretty much everything um, over the wireless uh, medium, learning, um, and all of the vertical applications, automated transportation, hopefully soon. Um, and so um, so it's kind of given us, given the society, a new um, way to, to, to conduct itself. And it is it has a rich history for over four decades, um, including physical layer design, resource allocation, and network protocols, uh, most of the audience here have worked on extensively, um, which led to generations of standards mainly driven by sort of industry. Um, and, and we're now in the 5G era where at least in principle, there's some flexibility in network design is, is coming into the future. Um, on the other hand, of course, as is the case with every generation, now that 5G is uh, starting to make its way, it is time uh, to shape 6G and beyond. So the typical new G um, brings significant speed up from the previous enabling new applications. Um, as I mentioned, 5G is actually attempting to do some changes in network design through virtualization, through softwareization. And that's good news for those in um, sort of foundational research um, that hopefully means going forward, we'll be more able to include sort of uh, more radical design into the network. So the, the idea of 6G or the next G however you want to call it, is to look for something other than an evolution. So um, we went from significant uh, applications from one generation to the other, mobile voice, SMS, some wireless data, and then 4G with uh, wireless internet, and 5G hopefully more, uh, more speeds, massive broadband, and IoT. So what's left um, for us, the vision of what's left is to design convergent networks um, with a lot of verticals and um, uh, cross-trust applications that are significant. So some of these are sort of reminiscent or what we, of what we've been trying to do, such as connected transportation and connected health, um, that is unlikely to reach its potential in the current 5G, which is typically the case. So that's how you want to go to uh, the, the next G. But there are also certain new applications that, um, or I should say new verticals that uh, we should be looking into more closely, namely foundational security and privacy, um, potentially energy sustainability, and what I call access equity, which is less economically motivated, but more societal motivated, which is to, uh, to try to connect the underconnected. And that's where the um, hybrid um, terrestrial satellite networks come in. So lots of things to do for um, all of the researchers related to uh, network systems. Um, so we are, uh, as I mentioned, envisioning wireless connectivity for all, um, hopefully sustainable, energy sustainable, internet of everything, um, lots of innovations and in spectrum sharing, um, secure and private, um, of course, integrated with native AI. Um, so to anyone who's in signal processing, communications and networking, 
this is, a, a, in, in our opinion, um, is an exciting era that's beginning, that's only beginning. Okay. Yeah. Your Zoom version is the presenter one. So what's that recording is the presenter um okay so okay so what should i do yeah display this one in the mirror Oh, I see. So stop share. Stop sharing. And um, share screen. Mm -hmm. Maybe the entire screen. Yes, yeah. maybe the entire screen. Mm -hmm. and then share the Thank screen. you for letting me know. I just read. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, oh, no. Well, I am still seeing the present. Okay. Everybody is happy with what they're seeing. Awesome. I really need more coffee. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, six years should connect everything. Right. So, that's where this that's the starting point. Um, and that hopefully involves disruptive design, um, not just the, um, not just disruptive technology. So that's embracing AI, connecting everyone and everything, security of privacy at the foundation, and as I mentioned, convergent networks, convergence of sensing, communication, computing, and learning. So um, um, Not sure why this is frozen because I'm actually this one shows yeah so the the one that's connected here is not quite working I feel like maybe there's a um maybe I'm not connected to Edurom anymore is that why yeah I think that my person is oh oh wait did you no no showing myself saying my person is I'm kind of trying to. Yeah, this is fine. I'm using my initial check here. The Zoom is up to date. You're connected to the video. That's fine. I think there's maybe internet connectivity, which, to no, my point, is fine. not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it is connected. That's fine. Maybe sometimes you just have to restart. This is a player in the presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or maybe reconnect. Or you to the yeah, so maybe reconnect. Yeah. Okay. No, this display is off. Let me just change it to laptop and then the other part will be. No, it is sometimes restarted. <laughs> the system on the wrongs. Oh, maybe. Maybe it's the... your display. Why don't you go to the next slide and see if that's the next one? No, yeah. but this is showing a different thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So there's something to do with your mirror displays as well. It's messed up. Arrangements. And then take it out and then mirror it again. No, 
Yeah, you can no, just, work. Yeah, you can just use Oh, this is the USB. Yeah, the USB have the. Uh, yeah, no, we don't need to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is this is why we need sixty. <laughs> Um, right. Um, and not just indoor or outdoor, right? So this um, notion of seamless and transparent, you know, or uh, one that is not going to, to disrupt the presenter will be much appreciated within the 10 years, right? So how do we get there? Lots of, uh, lots of new things are happening, which haven't been happening before. So when, um, let's say, some of our colleagues sort of said, wireless, you know, everything that's being done is done, let's move on to machine learning, um, all is great, but, um, but in fact, we are in an era, thanks to, uh, partially thanks to their efforts, we're in an era where everything's coming together. Uh, similarly, for circuits and semiconductors, there's a lot of innovations going on, um, that uh, leads to co-design with communications and networking. Um, of course, the data revolution has happened, and so integrating AI um, is, is now a major direction. So in short, convergence of disciplines is happening, which is not something that has happened in the previous ones. Um, in the previous one, you would get more bandwidth, higher frequency, which is going to happen, of course, as well, all the way up to terahertz band. But there's also uh, the technological advances that are converging that will allow us to actually um, seamlessly connect. Okay, so networks of nodes, uh, networks of networks with heterogeneous nodes with uh, and seamless connectivity, which uh, I think the past 20 minutes is a, is a good enough motivator to, to look into this. Um, Ed does much more than communicate, sensing, processing, storage, computing, learning. Um, we have new and novel metrics to consider. That's, um, they, these are all, 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 uh, all new and novel. So towards 60, expectations are already high. Um, and impact is needed sooner than later. Um, so days where we did the theoretical work and had hoped that it would go into some kind of standard in 30 years is long gone. Um, and we as academics have to have uh, um, more effort, I would say, in realizing our, uh, um, our ideas. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm mainly a theoretical person. So um, I just want to kind of uh, put, con put in context what I'm saying here. So the good news is uh, 60 may be the generation where these foundational ideas we've had can actually be realized. Um, uh, in fact, uh, there's even talk about including physical layer security ideas into 60 um, and some of the energy sustainable approaches. And as, as I mentioned there, there is a significant effort towards new and novel metrics other than throughput and delay um, that we have targeted for a number of decades. So I would say that the two key differences 
for the six-year revolution is uh, one is the human-centric connectivity, something that we haven't considered before on the communications or networking side. Um, and I'll talk about semantic communications a little bit, um, but there's also task or goal-oriented communications and usefulness metrics, such as the value of information or age of information. So this all goes to something other than just sending bits and trying to make sense of what's happening. So it's more like human-centric connectivity or human-machine interaction, if you like, on the wireless side. The other one is converting connectivity, joint communication and computing, joint learning and communications, uh, joint sensing and communications, and so on. So I would say for semantic task-oriented type communications, we have AI for wireless that came into the design of the network. We have also to remove this note so everyone can see it more clearly. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Um, and then for the thing, we're frozen again. Uh, and I am not sure why. Unfortunately, oh, okay, awesome. Good. I'll give it just a maybe. Everyone can, can see what they need to see. Okay. We're not touching anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, AI for wireless, um, great for semantic communications and uh, task oriented communications. Um, I will argue wireless for AI is uh, crucial uh, in the example I'm going to give for joint communication and learning, uh, and of course, joint communication and computation. So AI is in there in a uh, sort of a non-trivial, non-application way. It's there in an interior touch. So what's special about wireless? Uh, what it always has been special about, um, its properties, uh, the fact that it's a superposition, uh, it has a superposition property, the fact that it's an open medium, the fact that it's broadcast, um, the fact that it's time varying, which a um, couple of generations ago, we all viewed as disadvantages to deal with, interference management, avoidance, um, dealing with fading and averaging and so forth. Um, and we started to turn that around into advantages. Superposition, meaning this natural superposing of signals in the air, can actually give you communication efficiency and energy efficiency, as I'll point out later. Uh, broadcast nature actually allows you to to design security mechanisms on the fly, um, and the time varying nature actually provides you with opportunistic use of resources. So, um, so we want to capitalize on on these advantages using the properties of the medium. So, where we are, uh, mobile edge users are continuing to grow with ever powerful uh, devices, edge devices. Applications and use cases continue to expand, um, and uh, and we have now a reality that we're going towards distributed network intelligence. So in the rest of the talk, um, I'm gonna give examples of the interaction between intelligence and the wireless network. Um, uh, two main examples, um, and I'm gonna mention one last thing in the end. Okay, so uh, these are our uh, 6G core research areas, um, and I'm not gonna be talking about circuits and antennas, 
Um, I'm not going to be talking about programmable networks. Uh, I would like to talk first about semantic communications, uh, which will also have integrated AI, um, and then move on to joint communications and learning in smart radio environments, and in the end, maybe talk about energy sustainability a little bit. So that's the um, rest of the talk, which will end in three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, um, right. So, um, so uh, let's talk about semantic communications a little bit. So uh, semantic communications started as a means to try to address real life communications, which is uh, quite different than what we have uh, from the framework um, of the individual whose statue is in the front of this building. Um, in the real world, there is a noisy channel uh, which with, with, with weird characteristics. Um, and humans are these interesting species with unpredictable behavior. Um, they have an ability to infer quite widely. Um, they have different characteristics. They're sometimes influenced by uh, external factors and not in the necessarily the correct way. So we've all been living in this uh, new era of social media. In addition, um, for uh, the area of human-machine interaction, which has been uh, growing quite rapidly, especially in the past year, um, the intelligence, the I in AI is developing uh, towards human-like communication. And again, ability to infer quite widely is getting there uh, influenced by external factors, well, basically everything on the internet, um, and it's unreliable and rather unchecked yet, even though there's some effort towards regulation. So semantic communications uh, was a way to try to think about this in the context of communication network design, and how we have defined it, and I'm gonna to continue to insist on that definition, is uh, communications that takes meanings or what is being transmitted explicitly into account. Okay. Where the goal sort of becomes conveying the meaning and not necessarily the message in a reliable fashion. So the claim is this is promising for 6G for human-like communication uh, with hopefully resource savings. Um, uh, this note here is not because I'm in Michigan, but I, I, I repeat this in every talk I give, right? Semantic communication is not in contrast to information theory. It's definitely not beyond information theory or beyond Shannon. Uh, mainly because there's nothing beyond Shen, but um, but also uh, it's not sort of there to to uh, let's say um, invalidate the theory in any way or say that we can go beyond it, but to sort of really bring to reality some of the ideas that are there uh, with the with the help of context and 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 well, I think that's I'm not sure I agree with that because the whole premise of information theory is just there is no uh, explicit meaning to the note. You can convert it to bits, it doesn't matter what the meaning is. Correct. And it's just a matter of conveying what's supposed from one place to another. So that's it. Statistically conveying the thing from one point to another. Okay. Wait for a few slides. <laughs> um, by the way, this is not an information theory talk, um, but um, I. You know, there are a few slides I could not. Okay. Um, <laughs> there are many exciting directions transpiring in uh, semantic communication. Okay, so here's our um, famous sentence. Okay, um, so when Shannon puts in um, uh, the landmark work, um, this is right there in the introduction semantic aspects of communications are relevant. Um, and he uh, abstracted the problem into converting to digital sequences. So this is our conventional 
communication link, we have a message that is converted already to a digital uh, to, to a bit stream that is encoded, put it to the channel, uh, decoded, and, and we have an estimate. We have a reproduction of what was and the whole premise is to be able to rely to replicate um, what was sent. So the key, key assumption, as uh, BJ pointed out, um, to have this digital abstraction. Um, this key assumption allows for quantifying information, both in representation and in communication, and set forth uh, uh, the lossless compression as well as the reliable communication framework. Um, the framework is based on the statistical nature of the messages uh, and that of the noisy channel. And the primary goal at the time was to understand what was possible for the telephone network. Um, so that said, uh, even in the early days, there was a pushback, I would say, or there was a, uh, let's say, chatter right after whether how much this was uh, uh, applicable in real life communications, um, this notion of sort of dismissing uh, semantics. Although you see already later in the paper um, efforts towards understanding and applying this to real life in entropy of English and so on. So, um, so I will say uh, there's no doubt um, how important Shannon Limit has been um, to, to developing the digital age. Um, and I will also say that information theory has evolved quite a bit since 1948 in terms of its scope, in terms of um, the kinds of problems that it can address. Um, and this was foreseen even sort of right after the original work. Um, here's uh, sort of the little book uh, from 1949, co authored with Beaver. Uh, and yep, that's the signature. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in addition, some ideas are suggested for broader application of, of fundamental limits. So, already, sort of the um, thinking towards great distortion, thinking towards context is, is there um, right at the beginning. Okay. So that's the information theory part of the, of the talk. We're going to move to, to the communications. Um, and when we look into, you know, to maybe 10 years back, we see a lot more development. We see digital assistance, semantic web, uh, cyber-physical systems, IOE, et cetera. Uh, and perhaps, a communication with a purpose, I'd like to call, right? So I want to communicate to to get something done at an end point. So maybe revisit the metrics and the design framework um, and see what we can do there um, is, is um, warranted. And we're going to do this in the context of communication theory. OK, uh, so this was our proposal. Um, this was a, a long-term sort of uh, project that we had with DOD, and they were wanting to understand if there were uh, better ways of, uh, of uh, communicating the content or content um, aware communications, I should say. So our proposal was to come up with a communication theoretic approach to striving to convey the meaning rather than uh, uh, precise reproduction, let's say, of the, of the digital image. So, so the, it, it, we move away from trying to reliably reconstruct exactly what was sent, uh, but to, to try to make sure that the meaning of what is sent is, is uh, at, the, at the end point. Um, so this kind of allows for a wide range of interpretations, including lossy compression, summarization, joint source channel coding, and so on. Uh, and there are potential connections to both natural language processing and, and information theory. Um, so the approach is akin to developing digital communication systems, i.e. we are allowing errors for uh, developing um, uh, targets. Okay. 
And I will say this is, uh, again, this is a, a comment that I personally view this is a different approach than um, simply coming up with known metrics uh, such as the AO information and value. Okay, so this is a, a little paper from 2014 where we have tackled this approach for the first time um, and designed a system based upon minimizing the semantic, what we call the semantic distortion or semantic errors or errors in conveying the meaning of what you intend to, to communicate. Okay, so messages have meanings, sort of uh, uh, contrast sentence, um, and can we better design a system by integrating the meaning? Of the verbs in a physical communication system. For this work, uh, we simply looked into words, communicating words, and here's a caricature of what we envision. Um, so, from the perspective of syntactic errors, so suppose you're uh, you have a message that you want to communicate that corresponds to car. From the perspective of a digital communication system, if your noisy channel Convert the code word to something that corresponds to computer, you make an error. If you if it does to so automobile, you also make an error. Right? So I'm kind of oversimplifying, but just to give the idea. Um, whereas in fact, car and automobile means exa mean exactly the same thing. So why not just make sure that if you are to make an uh, if you are likely to make an error that error actually corresponds to something that's semantically similar, okay? Um, that can allow you to uh, uh, save resources and actually get what you need from the system, okay? Um, so, and so we define the semantic errors only when, or we define the error in the system only when the semantic is incorrect in the meaning. Okay, so for this work, we've simply looked into a standard uh, NLP tool that is a lookup table between uh, uh, different words, and you can see that car and automobile are most semantically similar, so they're synonyms, so therefore the similarity is one, and you know, if it were to be a bird instead, it'd be less, right? Um, because I guess there are some cars that brands that correspond to a bird. That's why it's not zero. Okay, so um, define the semantic error measure based on semantic similarities. Um, and based on this thinking, we, we attempted to find optimal index assignment. So that's a modulation, that's a code word assignment, um, which to, to assign the binary code words that are likely to be confused by the receiver to semantic similarities, so as simple as that, okay? Um, so the way to do this is to minimize the semantic error rate as opposed to the word error rate, okay? So um, here's sort of the uh, expected distortion that we have, uh, and this is uh, the assignment policy is pi, so the idea is to find the optimal policy that uh, minimizes the, the expected distortion, which then uh, turns out to be a quadratic assignment problem and therefore is NP hard. And at the time, and this is circa 2013, so prior to um, the Taylor AI revolution or machine learning revolution. So we actually went by um, uh, using a, an evolutionary, uh, using simulated annealing to, to, to find a near optimal approach. Um, we've also looked into a version of this with context. Uh, when the receiver knows the context, then it can further uh, influence the index assignment at the transmitter for further savings. So for example, if the receiver knows that uh, it's going to be a transportation-based uh, communication, then really um, there's no way it's going to be a computer, right? Um, so then it's going to be looking for things that are related to 
uh, car and automobile and so on and so forth. So you can further save in your assignments in, in, in terms of the number of bits that you can um, to, uh, you use to, to represent what you want to what you want to send. So in that case, we have a, uh, so without going into too much details, uh, in that case, we end up with a um, coloring of the characteristic graph, turns out to be, again, an empty hard problem, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and you can um, tackle that with, with near optimal approaches. Um, this was a paper from 2018, um, which took about three years to, to get published, I will say, because when we first started to uh, journal, we got a, a pushback saying, what the heck is this, basically? Right, um, <laughs> but this was a, a game theoretic framework where uh, we have an external agent that influences. Now we're much more used to influencers, um, the the system, uh, and we have uh, the, the, there's a game that's played between the external agent, external influencer, and the uh, transmitter receiver pair, um, where the the external entities intentions are probabilistic. So context helps uh, if it's truthful, context can hurt if it's adversarial. And so this was a way to, to address that uh, in that, uh, in that um, game theoretic framework. And the takeaway from this was, uh, if the agent is helpful leaning, then um, you can be optimistic and uh, and kind of take that context information into um, uh, having further savings. Um, some risk taking becomes a, a good thing. Um, on the other hand, if the uh, agent is adversarial uh, leaning, then you better not rely on that context and have each of your code words simply uh, be distinct from one another. Okay, so this was you know what happened. And then the project ended and so on. Uh, but in the in the in the same time, at the same time, the machine learning revolution has happened and that made its way um, to, to wireless. So um, we started seeing hundreds of papers um, getting machine learning type of approaches to um, design sort of end-to-end -end, uh, trans uh, transmitter receiver pairs um, and in networks. So um, at the same time, we started seeing sort of an excitement and a sort of a, a rejuvenation of this uh, notion of semantic communication. Um, this time around, thanks to uh, machine learning, uh, not just kind of you know words or or text even, but uh, different types of multimodal uh, you know. Uh, images and, and speech and so forth. Uh, again, with the goal of, um, let's say, recovering, uh, I'll be a little more general, recovering what is needed at the, at the receiver time. So it could be source recovery, it could be queries, it could be some task that is um, that needs to be completed. Um, lots of recent examples, mainly uh, deep uh, deep learning aided, um, and uh, mainly end-to-end uh, -end, uh, autoencoder-based designs. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, one little uh, paper that we have in this that takes a slightly different approach, and and uh, you'll see that the goal is a little bit different. So we're uh, definitely thinking along the same lines of 10 years ago, minimizing the semantic loss. Um, the goal, again, is to aim for significant resource savings. That uh, means communicating fewer bits, needing to communicate fewer bits to accomplish the, what, what is needed. Um, and hopefully something that, um, capitalizes on the advantages of all of these advances uh, in deep learning or learning in general, but uh, won't require us to um, spend a lot of resources in training and retraining. 
So we call this semantic text classification for the purposes of this uh, conference paper, it's text. Uh, we are now extending it to, uh, or we have uh, recently extended it to, to multimodal um, communication. So the idea here is to um, communicate exactly what's needed in extreme environments, in scarce communication resources, in scarce communication resources. So we're in a situation where we wanna maybe um, get a few bits out, that's all we have in terms of the communication budget, um, and, and can we do this somehow? Um, so the way we abstracted this problem is to have a semantic um, representation with the goal of having a classification at the receiver side. So our motivation, as I mentioned, uh, is a little bit different. We want to capitalize on the potential of learning without specializing to uh, specific text context. Um, and so thereby, our hope is to reduce or remove the training overheads. Okay. Um, and so uh, the approach uh, uses, as you can guess, pre-trained models, um, which have been uh, recently popular uh, in, in, in those problems and uh, uh, generation. Okay, so we're di uh, diverging a little bit from uh, most of the recent work that uh, capitalize or that uh, use, uh, let's say, uh, end-to-end models. Okay, so uh, we extract the semantics using a standard uh, sample skirt. Um, so what that means is, um, so th there's no need for an NLP background here. So all it is is you take the text, and um, so this S skirt module is going to give you a, a, a key dimensional vector. That's really all uh, that's needed here. Okay. And so um, the way it works is that um, vectors that are close in Euclidean distance are going to be close in meaning. That's really all, all their story. Okay. And so, um, right. So our semantic distortion then becomes um, the distance to the uh, sort of the nearest point that's in the code book. Okay, so what do we do here? Uh, we choose the policy that is going to minimize the semantic distortion um, and uh, the way the, the encoder module is we have our assignment policy here that maps our vectors to closest points that provides us with the index and now we can put uh, standard lossless coding on it, um, source coding on it to, to have the um, uh, and then uh, on the decoder side, of course, we have the inverse operation and then the classification. So the goal is to get sort of a rough idea of what's happened, right? So we don't need to reconstruct um, the exact communication. Okay. So we call this semantic compression um, and Oops. Uh, sorry, we call this uh, what I just talked about, semantic quantization. And then further, what we can do is to cluster um, our vectors into groups, and that we call a semantic compression. Um, and so we use a, a standard clustering algorithm here uh, uh, without sort of needing the number of clusters that we might we might need and then uh, go from there. So it's essentially the same type of philosophy, only cluster. Okay. So just to kind of visually see um, how the clustering works. Um, and again, so the example here is, or the motivator here is not to necessarily reconstruct exactly what was sent. So perhaps this was what was sent, and then you get um, this one or this one, which is kind of sort of what you need. Okay. okay, so why are we doing this? 
this is y, All right? So if I've answered, um, you know, everything correctly done in a regular communication system, still doing the lossless coding, still doing optimal uh, source coding, etc. cetera, um, this is how many bits I would need with 89% accuracy. I'm going down two orders of magnitude with 1% accuracy. Okay, so this is the reason why I'm doing this. Okay, same uh, with another data set. Uh, and in fact, uh, every data set we tried, we had this sort of a similar, um, yeah. <laughs> Question. Do you have to read the sound? So there are different languages of complex and um, chords, novel, and so on. Do you have to, is there a difference if you have to redesign the quantizer? It's actually quite efficient. Um, so, no, you don't have to do it every time. So, that's, that's the whole point, right? So, um, you do have to invest a little bit in the in the beginning, but you don't have to redo it. That's uh, that's the point. Yeah. We use um, the, the vectors, the vectors. How do you, is it related to uh, trees like word to vec? Yes, so word to vec was what we were using with words. So this is essentially sort of longer and sentences and short paragraphs that we have. And then to your point, um, so this is the size of the code book, if you like, that we're constructing. So you don't really have to be a very large um, code book here. Okay. okay. Um, so of course we want to try this over the wireless channel, um, and when we do this uh, again with uh, AWGN and uh, and and uh, uh, and really tight fading channels. Um, we see, um, so all I have done here is added the modulator and the solomon. Um, what we see, oops, where's my, what we see is a clear advantage in terms of what we want over um, approaches that are adopted, let's say, to this text classification problem. So my baseline is a vector quantized autoencoder and then end-to-end -end, uh, semantic, oops, end-to-end uh, -end semantic communication model um, that's uh, essentially joint source channel coding. Okay, so the vector quantizer or encoder is going to have uh, this uh, over here. So this is what replaces uh, as a baseline what our approach is, uh, and then the end-to-end -end model basically jointly train the um, uh, encoder transmitter. Um, so the performance metrics, I'm going a little bit fast because I actually want to talk about the second thing as well. Um, so two performance metrics, uh, channel use efficiency, um, of course, uh, in addition to accuracy, uh, number of channel uses to communicate the message set M, uh, and NA is the number of correct classifications. Uh, and so the, the uh, ratio of the two is one metric um, that's natural. The other metric is what I want you to, to focus on more. So this uh, effectively is the metric where we're given a time budget. And so within that time budget, you can do whatever the heck you want. Uh, how many classifications can you done for it? So that's our, our uh, main goal, and that's the motivator of this work. Okay, so accuracy-wise, uh, reasonable channel SNRs, we're doing pretty close in all of these, uh, including end-to-end -end training. Um, and in terms of classifications, uh, we're doing well with uh, at least compression. Um, and what I wanted to, to focus on is this one, where, in fact, the end-to-end -end approach that requires the training, the retraining, um, is, is a lot worse than these approaches. Right? So again, we're, we're in a sort of a time crunch. Perhaps it's an um, emergency situation. Um, how many of these can we do? Right, A lot better with this resource saving. So again, you know, accuracy, acceptable accuracy, the important thing is uh, resource saving. 
Uh, same thing with rally, exactly the same effect. Um, so this is one example of many things that uh, that can be looked at here um, using semantics and what is needed at the receiver. We were able to provide orders of magnitude, resource savings. Um, we don't require any assumptions, number of classes, etc. Um, it performs well on diverse data sets um, and in terms of how many things you can do uh, that are needed in a given time, that's better. Now, generally, there are lots of interesting directions in semantic communications over virus in particular. And um, importantly, most, all, almost all of the work is only point to point. This is just starting. So of course, all sorts of network premises, multi-domain approaches, uh, inference, um, security, both in terms of machine learning, um, adversarial learning, and communications. Lots of interesting things ahead. Okay, so I want to provide one more quick-ish example. <laughs> that's, um, that's in edge facilitated learning uh, in, in wireless. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw in intelligent surfaces into it, uh, which is expected again to prevail uh, for, for 6G. Okay, um, so we're, talk, talk, we're going to be talking about joint communication and learning, which can of course also be seen as joint communication and communication. Okay, so what are we talking about? We're talking about something that we're all familiar with, which is federated learning. Okay, um, wireless edge can be an asset. For AI, uh, we have lots of data generated at the local devices, and we have um, computation power. Uh, so rendering edge devices ready and able to aid in learning. Okay, so this is a new paradigm again for 6G uh, machine learning tasks performed by edge devices in a distributed manner. Uh, of course, in machine learning, it's a uh, newish paradigm, but six, I guess six years ago now. Um, and it is relevant for the increased role of AI in our lives and the increased role of our mobile devices in our lives. Um, this is an example of where these devices enabling non communication objectives in this particular. Uh, canonical example is collaborative machine learning model training. Okay, so what can machine, what can wireless do for this uh, connected distributed AI? Okay. Um, so typical federated learning setting, the goal is to train a machine learning model using local data sets, storage uh, stored at edge devices, um, and we will uh, iterate towards finding a model that is going to minimize our expected risk. All right, so how do we do this? Um, the global, the server, which orchestrates um, the global, uh, the, the collaborative training, announces a global model to all the edge devices. The edge devices take this global model um, and then uh, do local iterations using starting from this, this model, with, uh, for example, synthetic gradient descent, um, it generates a, uh, a, a new sort of updated model and then communicates something about this, this model or the model itself back and then the uh, server will, will aggregate and then announce the new model to start to collaborate uh, the um, edge training with. Okay, it's a converge. So, uh, so this is the canonical sort of you know there there are many um, uh, improvements or or modifications to it, but that's sort of the, where it started. Um, and the typical setup is one that's agnostic to the underlying physical layer and the underlying channel. 
um, each link is a noise with bit pipe. And then you go into this whole line of communication efficient federated learning, which then you know requires you to do some form of like client selection and all these things, right? So um, so we kind of took a different approach, which comes from this um, over the air federated learning, where you you have the sort of the understanding um, that you're communicating over the wireless channel, and you can do this in two ways. One is you could sort of emulate what's happening um, at the where where federated uh, learning came from with orthogonal transmissions. So each uh, edge device is on a uh, say uh, as a using OFDM in an orthogonal link, um, and then you're back to sort of this uh, notion. But you could do other things like uh, compression and sparsification as well, or um, you could just let it be in the wireless channel, sort of let everyone um, exploit the superposition property and transmit their updates simultaneously, um, sort of integrating communication and computation and having the air essentially doing the aggregation. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to follow here. Um, and recall that if, if th these were each messages that users were sending, this would simply be our multiple access channel. Okay, so uh, lots of work also in this, um, uh, including some of the sort of bells and whistles of uh, scheduling, et cetera. Um, typically, Optimizing communication, meaning the learning part, and communication separately. Okay, so what you do is you do what you want to do in terms of the learning part, optimizing the federated learning part, and then you go back and say, okay, so what's the best communication for this? So it um, ends up being a separate, two separate optimization problems. Um, the approach we took was to couple the two and jointly address the optimization. And how we did this is to interact the computation part, namely adopting the local steps, uh, which are device dependent and time varying, and uh, sort of the communication part, including the physical layer transmissions, trans the transceiver scaling, um, optimizing them together. So we call this adaptive over the air federated learning, um, which really starts with a learning objective. So our goal, again, is not to, um, we want to reliably communicate the updates, but our real goal in the system is to have a good model in the end. So it's a learning objective. That's where we start. We look into the convergence of the algorithm, um, and then from, in fact, the convergence uh, upper bound, we go back and see what we have to do in physical layer and, uh, and, and upper layer, uh, uh, medium access. Okay. Um, so we used to call this a cross-layer approach by the way, uh, 20 years ago. Right, um, so here's our federated learning model, sort of standard notation here, I don't have to repeat. Um, the convergence analysis doesn't require convexity, okay? Um, and then we're, we have the communication model, which is uh, a simultaneous transmission of uh, all of the participating clients. Um, typical wireless channel, um, rail related. So, um, uh, so this is a work from a year ago where uh, we designed the transmission signal, the scaling factor here, um, as well as the scaling factor at the uh, parameter server in order to ensure that we have a alignment in the, in the aggregation part. Um, I guess what I want to point out, uh, and you're welcome to um, send me questions uh, about the details of 
paper. Um, what I want to point out here is that um, coupled with our tower scaling factors is also the uh, number of local steps at each device at each iteration. Okay, so we're jointly optimizing all of them. Um, furthermore, uh, and importantly, we wanted to try this um, and we wanted to understand the impact of realistic wireless channel conditions. So, um, so we've expanded this to um, systems with estimated CSI at the clients. And why I'm making a big deal of this is when you do the convergence analysis, you will see exactly where each of these elements um, come from in terms of the impacts. Um, and not, not terribly surprisingly, this joint optimization approach, which for reasons I wasn't quite sure, wasn't tried before, uh, actually outperforms uh, the existing algorithms. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, we um, focused on non-IID data, which is more realistic. Again, the idea was to bring in both the learning and the communication to more realistic settings. Okay, so one more thing, I'm gonna bring in this um, reflecting intelligent surface. Why this is interesting to me as a physical layer person, um, these meta surfaces, these reconfigurable intelligent surfaces allows me to program the environment, right? Within certain constraints, so these are, think of these as little mirrors, many of them, that you can adjust um, to effectively change the channel to your advantage, okay? Um, so, um, so bringing in this uh, element, which are expected in, in 6G, particularly with communication objectives like uh, extending coverage and uh, avoiding, or actually even security. Um, here we're bringing this in terms of improving learning, wireless learning or wireless facilitated learning. Um, so we call this RIS assisted um, over the air federated learning. Um, again, the limited work in this seems to sort of turn the problem into a communication problem in the end, minimizing the for of error. And we wanted to, to get a um, joint optimization um, approach to this again. Uh, cross layer, again, uh, we call this, uh, has a sort of a nice acronym here, RIS Assisted Over the Air Adaptive Resource Allocation for Federated Learning. Um, expanding the previous uh, framework, adapting the local update state uh, steps, transit tower, and the RIS uh, phase shifts in concert. Um, again, realistic time varying physical layer, estimated CFI, non IID data distribution can handle non convex objectives. Um, and we see, I want to maybe try to quickly show you. Um, the, on the algorithm, we have the RAS phase design. Now we have to include in the um, federated uh, learning iteration, um, which requires some kind of manipulation, let's say, on the optimization part due to non convexity. Um, again, please ask me um, after the talk, I'm trying to actually finish on, well, maybe not on time, but almost on time. Okay, so here, here's our algorithm. Um, we have uh, the RIS design in each global iteration and then um, uh, uh, over the air federated learning uh, by each, each uh, edge device. Um, so this uh, version of the algorithm um, foresees one RIS included in the network which means uh, in each iteration, the best thing to do is to try to adjust your RIS um, for one user. And I say this only because um, if you remember sort of the proportional fairness type uh, work from way back when, uh, we've also looked into making sure that each user sort of got their own fair share in terms of rate. And here we're doing this, it's a choice, but here we're doing this based on 
the previous number of iterations per user and we're changing um, which user according to uh, uh, we're going to, to, to adjust the, um, uh, the reflecting surface in each time. Okay, so uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all I want to show here is um, the fact that we can quantify the wireless elements. Okay, so I have the channel estimation error here that's introducing. Um, I have the uh, channel noise that's introducing. Um, expansion to downlink is going to bring exactly the elements that are coming in from the downlink channel estimation error and uh, downlink channel noise error. So this is uh, where this is sort of a full system where you have a noisy channel going up, noisy channel coming down. Okay. All right, so quick numerical results. I want to point out um, this is the adaptive approach. Uh, without the RIS, this is what an RIS with 16 elements brings. Okay, so quite a, 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 a increase in accuracy, and this is the state of the art. This is a very simple. Uh, this is actually MNIST. So the state of the art um, in this case actually fails. It's, it's getting about 10 percent of accuracy. Um, and then with noisy downlink, same same thing. Um, with the, this realistic setting of estimated CSI fading channels, non IID distribution, the state of the art uh, fails, uh, and we do reasonably well. Um, and here is, uh, uh, and the more elements you have, the better you're going to do, um, as expected. Um, and here is one with a non convex objective. Um, where again, our approach works, whereas uh, um, separately optimizing communication and learning doesn't. Right? Okay, um, this is very new, it's in submission. Um, so we just sort of changed the model a little bit. Suppose that you're you have a wireless network where each device can have a personalized RAS, maybe a small one, uh, but this is one where you can now adjust each of the RASs according to uh, what each user needs. Um, what we have done here is to introduce personalization into the federated learning model in wireless. So this is uh, the personalization part in machine learning has been uh, Dealt with quite uh, quite extensively, but not in the in the wireless one. So we brought this in here, um, and so um, here, what you see is the RIS design per user, um, the over-the-air federated learning, and then the personalization part that's coming into um, the, the the algorithm. Um, and looking at the CNF test test accuracy here, uh, we can see that. Uh, our, our accuracy is, is quite good. So, so this is fashion in this. Um, so it just kind of, oops, showing the reasonably good performance. Okay, um, so new way of looking into using the wireless medium to improve uh, learning um, and can be uh, extended to uh, things like personalized personalized models. Okay. Um, and including this new uh, network elements, the smart operating in a smart environment actually is good for your learning, uh, learning uh, accuracy. Okay. So what's next? Uh, more peer-to-peer type uh, uh, setups, how to network learning entities, again, in the in the wireless uh, environment. Um, uh, so privacy preservation uh, in peer-to-peer -peer or federated learning in wireless channels. So this is uh, something that we're just starting, um, trying to get uh, our fearless leader here excited about this. Um, I have some slides I can show you all the time. 
Um, so we, we actually have something. Uh, right. So um, dealing with data set and distribution dynamics. So this is something uh, in, in, a, in a separate uh, project we started looking into. Um, whenever you have your data sets that could be impacted by the model that you have just developed. A uh, typical example of this is uh, routing algorithms, right? So um, you look at Google Maps or whatever, and then you follow that and it ends up the, the traffic patterns actually change. So how do we actually um, design these algorithms? And now we're gonna bring them again into, into wireless. Um, and utilizing wireless for more than just collaborative uh, model, model training, okay? Um, I promised you there's like five minutes. I'm going to try to finish in five minutes. There's one more consideration, okay? Um, and that's the fact that all of these things that we're envisioning, they're super energy expensive, right? Um, so in fact, this is a, a, you see this, this uh, sentence quite a bit now, carbon emissions of training a single model can get as large as the lifetime of five cars, right? Um, millions of wireless devices, training regularly, um, that doesn't seem like a very environmentally uh, friendly approach. So we do need sustainable machine learning approaches, okay? Um, I would say this is something that people talk a lot, but hasn't quite uh, made its way into uh, research problems. Um, uh, so we kind of took a look at this and have a small uh, thing that I want to talk about that could serve as a, as a starting point. Um, and it kind of relies on some work that uh, we have done over a decade ago called energy harvesting communication. So um, in this line of work, we looked into designing communication links um, when in energy arrivals are inter intermittent, could be infinite in terms of um, you know, how much it could be, but rather than having a, a single charge, rather than having a certain battery energy level, you have your energy sort of arrive during, during the communication itself. And um, that turned out to be sort of a really fertile um, research area because we were able to see the differences in scheduling and resource allocation uh, in networks as well as um, the fundamental limits. So the same sort of thinking of suppose you have energy, but that energy could be time varying in terms of its availability to the learning task. Um, and you can imagine this, not necessarily in the context of energy harvesting communications, but you can imagine this as, you know, you have your mobile device, which of course isn't just exclusively doing federated learning or learning, has to do a lot of communications for other things, um, computations for other things, right? So we're just going around with these um, mobile computers and we may have um, availability that is time varying in terms of the energy that is devoted to this learning task. So, um, so um, this was the sort of the background and thinking of this, um, how do we design, in this case, federated learning algorithms without compromising accuracy, okay, in this uh, intermittent energy situation. And a uh, very sort of very, very simple abstraction of this. Um, we, we had a very simple uh, setup. Users have a, a unit size battery, no storage. Um, and uh, uh, we have classified users into different classes according to their energy availability. Okay, so it was a very, very simple abstraction. And, um, and so the longer, um, the larger E1 is, the longer sort of your renewal cycle, which means you're less, you're more energy sparse. Okay. So all I want to show is that in this case, what we've been able to do by simply scaling our updates with this sort of period, renewal period, we were able to obtain accuracy in a non-biased manner um, 
that is comparable to if all users had this sort of fixed energy budget uh, from beforehand. It's sort of just, a, a, again, a, a sort of an initial paper, but at the end of the day, what we're getting here is a comparable accuracy here. So this is the, the blue one is our algorithm and the red one is the regular federated averaging. The benchmarks are, um, so the, the, the green one is the following. Um, uh, the green one is when everyone participates whenever they have enough uh, available energy, which means it ends up being biased towards the users that are much more you know, energy rich. And then, so it's kind of terrible in terms of the entire system. Um, and then the black one is one that's a patient sort of parameter server that waits for everyone to be able to participate, which means it's going to be very slow in converting, right? So this was just kind of to show people that this is a potentially something that we should look at, again, with the thought of designing the system underneath. Same thing with stochastic arrivals. Um, so what's next here is it's a very, kind of a beginning problem that I've shown. Uh, we need more realistic energy consumption models, uh, particularly with respect to computation as well as communication. Uh, realistic energy acquisition, uh, impacts of storing energy, um, and the imperfections of storing energy, which proved important in communication. Transmission with the wireless channel and dealing with total energy costs. So lots of things to do here as well. Um, that brings me to the conclusion. One, embrace the wireless edge in learning. It's actually possible to improve learning by the edge, taking into account that we are communicating in the wireless medium. Second, embrace semantics, context, and goal and task of the communications, why it's good for, communicate with a purpose, paying attention to that provides new frontiers for wireless communications. And yes, 6G future is bright. And here, um, thank you very much. These are uh, my students and my collaborators who uh, contributed to this work. Uh, and you can find all of our publications. Take that in perfect hand. Yeah, thank you so much for the great talk. Yeah, we got something. Okay, cool. Yeah, exactly on the hand. Yeah, thank you so much. And oh, there are some fishing.